Imri, you founded RMI and started working on the energy transformation uh, over 30 years ago. What does that legacy represent? Uh, it's not just my life's work. I think it's a really important contribution to making the world better and safer and richer and fairer and cleaner. Uh, we have had the good fortune to ask the right questions at the right time and help figure out how to make big 50-year changes in very complex systems. So we've already managed to uh, begin very clearly the transformation of commercial real estate, the automotive sector, the electricity sector, and some industrial ones as well. Uh, some old industries and some new ones like semiconductors and uh, data centers. Uh, and in the process we've come up with a lot of quite fundamental intellectual capital that will be playing out for the next half to one century, things like integrative design uh, that uh, we're just starting to scratch the surface of, uh, showing how to make very big energy and resource savings cost less than small ones. So you get expanding returns, not diminishing returns. That's, that's a game changer in a lot of fields. So I, I feel very fortunate that we've been in the right place with the right people and ideas at the right time. Uh, to start making a big difference. RMI has really amazing people working here. What makes people so important for the work that RMI is doing? Well, no work gets done without people, and we need people who are fearless, imaginative, ready to ask new questions. Of course, once you ask the right question, that's the hard part, then the answer becomes self-evident. Uh, but uh, people are, are not at RMI just for a job. It's a calling, uh, and uh, our, our hierarchy of needs is basically to save the world, have fun, and make money in that order. If you have a different sequence, maybe you should be somewhere else. Uh, <clears throat> but we've been immensely blessed with the uh, quality of the people we've managed to attract, and more coming all the time. We, we're able to be quite selective. Uh, and uh, increasingly we're hiring on aptitudes and attributes rather than on resume and experience, but we get both. Very, very strong experience, but the ability to uh, sustain vision across boundaries, ask new questions, find uh, strikingly new answers. It's a very exciting place to be. Also a lot of young people. Do you see an increased engagement of the younger generation with the issues that RMI is working on? I, I think so, and interestingly, many of the uh, young uh, innovators are better than we were at that age. So I, I think the future is in good hands. Why are you so excited to be part of RMI? It is a real privilege to join a team of incredibly dedicated and smart people who are working on one of the most fascinating, one of the most complex, but above all, one of the most important things that we're dealing with as, as mankind. So the energy transformation offers an incredible opportunity for business success, but it is also the answer to a major challenge that we face as mankind, namely the issue of climate change. So being smack in the middle of that innovation is a, is a real pleasure. Do you think having spent about a decade at, at Shell was particularly useful preparation for this? Oh, having worked in the energy sector at Shell, but also at, at other points in my career, is incredibly helpful because it allows you to understand not only the economics, but also the behaviors and the motivations of people in the industry. Mm -hmm. and. Um, Looking at the IT sector, the telecom sector, we have seen over the last 20 years how difficult it is for large organizations to make the transformational changes that are necessary. And many of those elephants didn't learn to dance and as a result have fallen by the wayside. And so it is very interesting to look at the energy sector and see how these companies are struggling to adapt. And then it certainly helps if you've been part of one of those organizations to, to deeply understand what motivates them and how they, how they operate. And that's a very different experience than you had as a member of the Dutch Parliament for a 
center-right party. Uh, that, that must give you some interesting insights into how, how the sausage machine works. <laughs> yes, and, and of course policy making is different in Europe from the United States, from places like China, um, so that is not universally applicable. But it is certainly true that I learned from spending time in Parliament that the ability of government institutions to look over the horizon at long-term challenges is very limited. Their ability to act if there's no, imme no immediate crisis is limited. And also, very often, the inspirational ideas of how they should act are in fact codifications of what is already happening. So the work that RMI does in laying out business models, in creating financing mechanisms, in driving innovation, in, in helping develop new technologies, is in fact instrumental in later on creating some of the regulations and the policies that are necessary for the scaling up of those innovations. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you learned from this experience how to help government steer, not row, but the uh, primacy of the private sector in doing the rowing. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I, I believe that one important lesson we took out of um, the, the period in the run-up to the Copenhagen Climate Conference a number of years ago is that this is not a problem that is primarily going to be solved by policy being applied top-down. It is a problem that is primarily going to be solved by people working together bottoms up mm -hmm. and, and governments, be it municipal or community governments or provincial governments, state governments, federal government, uh, codifying, writing down what the right answers are for, for the, the change and the innovation, uh, but usually after the fact. Armaya has also got an incredible group of donors. Mm. Um, what is so important to, to RMI of those donors? Most obviously, they make our work possible. Uh, they've contributed nearly $100 million in today's dollars over the last 31 years. And that has uh, funded almost all of our creation of important new intellectual capital. Now, what's not so well known is that over that time, we have earned nearly as much in programmatic enterprise uh, supporting our mission uh, with 14 different revenue models, and that includes five for-profit spin-offs. So uh, basically, we, we take what our donors uh, fund us to learn and create, and then we apply, test, break, fix, refine, and scale it in partnership with uh, typically large firms that are very keen to solve a tough problem. So we work on it together with them. Their problem gets solved because we, we learn so quickly together. We learn a lot. We get experience and reputation. Uh, they pay us a fee for service, and that then leverages the philanthropic funding. Uh, and most importantly, we get out of it teachable cases and competitive pressure for emulation, which then spreads uh, our breakthroughs in technology, policy, design, and business models uh, so that they can take over a sector because they make sense and make money. Uh, now, our donors also help us in contacts, in ideas. Some of our best programs have been suggested by donors, and we are increasingly shaping our programs uh, in a way that, that really takes advantage of, takes off from their wisdom and experience. Uh, that's how uh, our uh, Reinventing Fire China initiative got started, for example, I think it, it makes it stronger and more effective. It sounds like the role of philanthropic money in the work that RMI is doing is really catalytic. And with that catalytic financing, uh, donors then see a very large return on their investment yeah. because it leverages other revenue models. Exactly right. Yeah, so we we are we are not simply a uh, a think tank. We're a think and do tank, and the the important word is the and. <laughs> yeah, and do you see uh, a shift in the balance between those two? Is is doing more important 
now that we are further along in thinking through that transformation, is it, is it becoming more important to think about impacts? Very much, uh, but of course, the more impact you want to have, the more carefully you have to think through how you're going to achieve it. So the two grow together, they're very much entwined. Uh, and I think it is possible that uh, in, in the coming years we will be uh, returning to a more historically normal fraction of over 40% earned income. Uh, but <clears throat> it's a little hard to plan. It depends on what the market is ready for and whether something will work better in one model or another. But we're, we're rather agile and opportunistic. And that's, that's another great virtue of the kinds of wise donors we have, that they, they trust us to, uh, to innovate and uh, implement without having to breathe down our necks all the time. Uh, and it, it means we can work more efficiently, but also we can learn a lot faster. Many groups are uh, somewhat uh, constrained by fashions in the foundation world, for example, which move a lot slower than the things we need to be doing. So uh, people who can provide flexible general support and make us as agile as possible will do the most good. Why is it so important for uh, RMI to receive the donor support it does? Donors are critical to what we do. Um, we bring together very passionate and talented people. Um, we mobilize through our work uh, a lot of collaborators and, and stakeholders. But that effort can only be undertaken if we have the financial means to do that. And if we want to increase the speed with which we work, if we want to uh, drive for more impact, we want to make sure that this energy transformation happens much faster than we've historically seen then we need to grow our own capabilities. And for that, we need the help of the donors who've been on our side to, as well to, as new to donors. To deliver the outcomes that they want. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And, and I think people are increasingly clear what those outcomes are. Energy efficiency, accelerated deployment of renewables, switching our transport away from fossil fuels. It is clear that many of the answers are starting to emerge. But driving for that implementation means reaching out to a much wider audience, touching many more people. And that requires more resources on our side. So donor support is absolutely critical. You've been instrumental in creating some of those catalytic transformational changes. And at the same time, the energy industry is still talking about a very slow and gradual pace of change. Do you envision that the pace of change in the energy sector is going to pick up over the next years? I think the pace of change in energy is extraordinary, unprecedented, and for very basic reasons. We're used to big shifts in energy taking a half century. This one looks faster, and a lot of the reason for that is that many of the technologies are granular, uh, modular, mass-produced, manufactured products. So it used to be if you wanted to make more electricity, you had to spend a decade and billions of dollars building a cathedral, which we called a power plant. But then <clears throat> with today's technology, in the time it takes you to do that, you can each year build a series of uh, photovoltaic factories, so 10 of them all together. And then each year, each of those will produce enough solar cells to produce each year the same amount of electricity that your power plant would have produced when you got done with it. Uh, well, that scales incredibly fast. That's how China last year got more new electricity uh, from non-hydro renewables than from all fossil and nuclear sources combined. Nobody ex expected that. Uh, but, <clears throat> you know, that's that that is the the new normal and it applies to efficiency and renewables they are rapidly taking over the market they're a better buy they have less risk they manage all the risks better and uh, I, I think whether in electricity or in fuels uh, this is the new reality that scaling can happen faster than we've ever seen 
uh, of course, aided by information technology and spread of good ideas faster and smarter finance models. And I, I think uh, that is going to transform the energy landscape at a pace very uncomfortable for the incumbents. So part of our job is to help them figure out uh, how to respond to the insurgents. So in, in our eLab, Electricity Innovation Lab, we have a safe place for them to talk to each other and create value rather than lobbing grenades. And uh, that's turning out to be very fruitful. Uh, now the incumbents may fail. Uh, there are a lot of mainframe computer companies that aren't around it anymore. IBM's about the only one that, that made the transition. Uh, and there, are, uh, there were a lot of problems in the wireline phone companies when cell phones came along. But solar cells are scaling faster than cell phones did. So I, I think, uh, you know, fasten your seatbelt, hang on to your hat. This is going to be a hell of a ride. In order to take our work to the next level at RMI, why is it important to understand our history and where we've been? Well, there are many lessons hidden in history in general and in RMI's history specifically. Um, you pointed out to me, Amory, that it starts by asking the right questions. It starts by reframing the discussion from a different perspective. And um, in particular, when it comes to looking at the relative attractiveness of renewables versus fossil fuels, or even more importantly, the relative attractiveness of energy efficiency to fossil fuels, it is important to look at the overall cost, the overall capital charges, the overall risk for, for each of these solutions. And if you reframe the question mm -hmm. to that sort of lifetime consideration of all the cost and put all of that in your financial economic analysis, then you quickly find that many of the new solutions are starting to get ready to compete. Another interesting lesson from the past is that innovation takes time, that you can come up with a good idea, but that you have to figure out a way to quickly drive that idea into implementation. And if there's one thing that we now need to do is to accelerate that scaling, drive that impact. So if you think of our model of innovation as creating a really good snowball, a good idea, and rolling it down into the valley, we've got to make sure that those snowballs accelerate faster and become big <coughs> avalanches of change at the bottom of the valley. How has your work standing up and leading the European Climate Foundation uh, prepared you for your new responsibilities at RMI? The European Climate Foundation, um, which is in many ways similar to the Energy Foundation here in the United States, um, saw a tremendous opportunity in making people collaborate to solve complex problems. Um, so often in the past, people have taken an adversarial approach to thinking through the energy transition that is necessary. And there is an important role for sometimes challenging the incumbents and sometimes asking the painful and awkward questions. But there's also an enormous amount to be gained from thinking through difficult problems in a collaborative manner, bringing all the stakeholders around the table, listening carefully to what everybody has to offer and uh, m delivering out of that the best solutions. Uh, so that is, I think, probably the most important thing that we took out of our work um, in, in Europe. And I think that RMI has historically proven to be very good at that. What you call charrettes, the workshops where we bring people together, uh, those are effective mechanisms to get people around the table and listen to each other. Where do you want RMI to be in five years? That's a good question. Um, I would hope that five years from now uh, we have uh, an impact around the world uh, that has significantly scaled from, from the impact that we have right now. RMI has done a great job in influencing um, thought leaders and, and key players here in the United States and uh, your influence reaches well beyond the borders of the United States. But this is a global problem, so we need to think on a more global scale. Uh, and we need to accelerate 
the, the challenge of climate change and the energy crisis we're facing is so significant that we can't go on the pace that has historically been the pace of the incumbents in the industry. So acceleration and global scale are two drivers for the division for RMI. We've never been noted at RMI for lacking ambition. If we were, we wouldn't have undertaken such clearly impossible things as we've already done. Uh, but uh, I think you're saying we are going to become even more audacious. We are certainly going to have to be more audacious. The challenge in front of us is enormous. And uh, the pace at which we need to drive uh, impacts is, uh, is significantly higher than it ever has been. And that realization means that, that we all have to step up to the plate. So yes, we are going to be more audacious, uh, while at the, main, the same time keeping up that deep thinking work to make sure that we think through the answers and think through the solutions in the right way. So Amory, that impact is a big driver for us. If you look back, what do you think is the essence of the impact that RMI has had so far? And how do you see that going forward? If we look just at energy, although that's not the only thing we've worked on, it's the one we're best known for, I would say we've redefined the problem been instrumental in cutting uh, energy use by more than half in the U.S. and in many other countries, uh, and laid many of the foundations for the uh, distributed and renewable energy revolutions. That's, that's a tall order, but if you look at what we've actually achieved in each sector, I think that's what it adds up to. And going forward, how do you envision our contribution continuing? I think we will continue to drive the efficiency and renewables revolution even better, even faster, uh, and with and, and many many of the things that take a long time to hatch out because industries like automotive and electricity change very slowly are starting to become now evident to everybody. Now they're looking back at how we forecast it and made it happen 20 or 30 years ago, but. You know, it's like planting a seed, and there's a day when it sprouts, and then pretty soon it's big. That's the stage we're in now. What are you most proud of about RMI's work, Amory? I think it's most satisfying not just that we've gotten results, but that we haven't made anybody an enemy. We have often gotten results in collaboration with those you would think would be least welcoming of those results. So we've, we've managed through Aikido politics uh, and, and rational argument to turn uh, presumed opponents into supporters and implementers. I think that's a rather distinctive feature of our work. We're, we're non-adversarial uh, and empathetic. This doesn't mean that, that we condone or like bad conduct. There are some bad actors out there, but uh, it does mean that we work constructively with everybody, and this gives us our convening power and ability to make big change in the most recalcitrant industries that would really rather have all the change go away and just be comfortable with what they know, but we help them understand and adopt what they don't know that will work better for them and everybody else. And in that context, the degree to which we can expect change coming from the federal administration is limited. Mm -hmm. A lot of the activity is happening from the bottom up. How do you see that playing out? Well, it was obvious uh, when we founded the Institute over 30 years ago that the national government, especially in this country, would become less effective, uh, more inward-looking, more corrupt, less functional. And therefore, we did not follow the path that most other groups followed of having a legislative strategy and trying to get new laws from Washington. We realized that in a big, diverse country, uh, 
policy changes could also happen at a state level with a lot of labs figuring out quickly what works. They could happen at a municipal and community level. And most of all, they could happen in the private sector. So we resolved to use our society's most effective institutions, private enterprise, co-evolving with civil society, sped by military innovation, to go around and run our least effective institutions. And I think that strategy has served us well. I don't think it's likely to change. I, I don't see uh, a high likelihood of Washington gridlock simply dissolving because it goes back to um, corrupt campaign financing and gerrymandering of congressional districts and a lot of other things that would take quite a while to, to fix. Uh, so right now we have the best federal government money can buy. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, therefore, although I admire those who toil in the trenches of Washington trying to make that better, I'm glad that we are not one of them and that uh, we're going around that mess <laughs> and uh, getting things done in, in effective ways. And that is a very different context here in the United States from the one in China. In China, you've decided to operate at the state government level. Tell us about that project and how that is different from what you expect here. Well, every country has different ways of doing things. I've worked in 50-odd countries, and, and uh, China has a very effective top-down central government. It, it, they, they still say heaven is high and the emperor is far away, uh, so it's not always easy for the central government's orders to get carried out in the provinces and with strong mayors with their own ideas and so on. So there's diversity there too that, that I think can be very useful. But <clears throat> the country does run on a five-year plan. We had, I am told, considerable influence in the plan adopted for 2005 onwards. Uh, in making energy efficiency the top strategic priority for China's national development. And we are hoping that as our reinventing fire collaboration with some top Chinese energy institutions evolves in the next two years, it will inform the new five-year plan that comes out in 2015 and uh, help uh, them greatly accelerate their already remarkable work in efficiency and renewables. So we have a lot to learn from each other. Uh, China now burns more coal than everybody else put together. Uh, China has just become the world's biggest oil importer. They don't like that either. They have serious energy problems. They need help. They think that what we have could be helpful. Uh, and I'm very pleased that uh, the, the respectful engagement in, in, that we have undertaken with them uh, is being very warmly received. Uh, I think this could be the most important thing we've done for climate protection and a number of other issues and could perhaps serve as a uh, platform for other forms of collaboration as well. Our, our two countries have a lot to do together. Our economies are very much intertwined uh, and we have so much to learn from each other. It's, it's quite an exciting journey. So what keeps you up at night? When I, when I do get to muse in the wee hours, it's typically about how could we do things better? Uh, are we missing some blindingly obvious, once you see it, uh, way to communicate more effectively, to accelerate our, our work even more, to get bigger results scaled faster? Uh, this, you know, humans are the first self-endangered species Mm. And uh, if we want to get out of that unwelcome status, we have a whole lot of work to do real fast. So <clears throat> we, we want to uh, make a reasonable number of mistakes by being bold, but we want to learn very quickly from them, not do them again. Uh, and <clears throat> therefore, uh, we, uh, we have big challenges in scaling and acceleration uh, for which we need everybody's help. It's interesting that you mentioned the scaling and the acceleration because sometimes a criticism of RMI has been that we are a glass half full organization, an optimistic, you would say, an applied hope organization. I, I would say the glass is neither half empty nor half full, it's just twice as big as it needs to be. <laughs> <laughs> Explain that. Well, if it's 
half empty, it needs to be only half as big to hold the same water. But, and of course it's expandable by efficiency, but <clears throat> perhaps a, not, not, a, not a good joke, but uh, you know, we, we're, we don't um, merely entertain a, a glandular optimism that everything's gonna be okay, we, need, we can just sit back and things will unfold by themselves. We are intently engaged in solving big, difficult problems that others have not been able to solve. I think we've been doing well at them, uh, but uh, we do that in a spirit of applied hope, and the, the applied part is very important. It's not theoretical hope. It's creating the basis for that hope every day by what we do. What are you most hopeful about, for example, in uh, climate protection? Well, the interesting thing is that the energy transformation brings tremendous opportunities across a broad spectrum of benefits. There is, of course, first and foremost, the issue of climate change. And uh, at the same time, the energy transformation will bring energy to people uh, at the bottom end of the pyramid in a much more cost-effective way, decentralized right in their village. And there are enormous health benefits associated with making the transformation. And if you look historically, we can look forward to a much safer and securer world if we make the energy transformation. So there are many benefits to be had. And what gives me optimism is the enormous amount of innovation and creativity that is happening in the energy sector right now. Recently I read that the number of patents being filed in the area of uh, energy innovation has rapidly increased and far more patents being filed now in the new energy technologies than the fossil fuel technologies of the past. I think it's a good indication of that applied hope that you talked about earlier, that we can be optimistic. The fact that uh, entrepreneurs, business people, but also social leaders and social entrepreneurs are are getting their hands dirty with the new technologies, the new ideas that will drive the energy transformation. I had a very hopeful uh, word recently uh, when we had just launched our Chinese collaboration in Beijing on June 19th, 2013. Uh, afterwards, the chair of the advisory committee, which is a bunch of state councillors and ministers, many of whom will be writing the 13th five-year plan that we hope to inform, uh, <clears throat> said to two of our party, uh, you know, there are a lot of things our governments don't agree about. This is not one of them. We, as our presidents agreed a few weeks ago, we must solve the energy and climate problems. We must do it together. It's vital to the security and prosperity of both countries and of the world. And it could help launch other forms of collaboration. About a week later, I happened to be in the Pentagon. I'm an advisor to the Chief of Naval Operations. And uh, I was with a number of three-star admirals who uh, have less pleasant interactions with uh, another part of the Chinese government, more or less daily. And when we were lining out the day, I was saying, sorry, I've got to leave at 1600 to go over to the Chinese embassy. To do what? Well, I've got to brief the economic counselor on our initiative in China. What's that? So I told them. Whereupon the most senior three-star immediately said, Godspeed, this is vital to the security and prosperity of both countries. Same language, very encouraging. Yeah, and it is interesting to see how the speed at which this energy transformation is happening is picking up all around the world, particularly also in places like China, Brazil, India. Mm -hmm. uh, I think historically we've thought that the developed world would set the pace, would develop the technologies, would take the lead, and that the emerging economies would follow. And in some of these industries we are now it's definitely aware. seeing an inversion uh, with the lead coming from them. Uh, so also from a perspective of competitiveness of the United States economy, it is of critical importance that we pick up the pace. Somebody once asked Dana Meadows, uh, do we have enough time to get out of this mess? And uh, 
she answered, I think, correctly, yes, we have exactly enough time starting now. Yeah, and that holds very much true for the energy transition. We have exactly the right amount of time if we start today at a fierce pace that certainly will pose challenges for everybody engaged in, in this issue. But less than the challenges of not doing it. Absolutely, absolutely. And as you know, Amory, that is what gets me out of bed in the morning. My personal motivation is not just the fascinating intellectual challenge that this energy transformation brings, both from a technology and a social point of view, but also the fact that we have a moral responsibility to safely hand over this planet to our children and grandchildren. And if we don't address the issue of the energy transformation um, with sufficient speed and intensity, we'll not be able to do that. And you're the father of four. I'm about to become a grandfather, uh, so we both have reason to think about this. Absolutely.